You are listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Welcome to Scuderia F1, the podcast that's always up to speed with the latest Formula One news. Follow us on Twitter at Scuderia F1 Pod and subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. Now, here are your hosts, Mark Daly and Kevin Laramang. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of Scuderia F1, the podcast that is always up to speed with Formula One racing. I'm your host, Mark Daly, and I'm welcoming you to the show tonight, but I am not alone. As always, I'm joined by the man himself, Mr. Kevin Laramie, co-host of Scuderia F1 and the founder of the Sports Podcasting Network. Kevin, you're a busy, busy man. Are are you awake? Are you hanging in there? Because we've just gone from the Euros (laughs) and we're into Rio 2016 and it's SPN. We never rest, you specifically, more than maybe the rest of us. But how, how are you hanging in there tonight? Well, I'm doing pretty good. Tonight was the uh, opening ceremony for the uh, Olympics in Rio, and it was quite a long process. And I have to say, for once, I'm going actually disappointed that it wasn't actually a fun show. So my mood, it's not just my mood, but more my energy has been dampered by the opening ceremony of Rio. <laughs> well, at least from one point of view, Formula One has gone into a three-week break. We're almost a week into it already, so we've got a, a shortish show prepared tonight, so at least we'll be able to step away from Formula One for the next couple of weeks and take a break before the, the Belgian Grand Prix, and, and we can all concentrate and enjoy the uh, the Olympics. But in the meantime, we, we should circle back quickly and talk about uh, the, the German Grand Prix, and there's a couple of items of news that we want to uh, talk about. But again, it was another disappointing result for Nico Rosberg, despite a very good qualifying session in which he snatched the pole position when he had a problem with his car. It was quite surprising, but he had a very disappointing start, probably yeah. the worst start he's had the entire season so far, and ended up not first, not second, not third, but in fourth behind his teammate and behind the two Red Bulls. It could have been worse, too. He's lucky that he managed to get that pace just in time to be able to hold off the Ferraris and the rest of the cars because it was getting... When you see start and basically his non-start, everybody just overtaking him right away. It could have been a lot worse for Nico Rosberg if he didn't change the mode or... It's funny when you look at his steering wheel when he's doing the the start. Once again, it seems more distracted by what he has to do than just driving the damn car to start the race. So uh, it's a lot to do in what fractions of a second... But again, it's costly for Nico Rosberg. Yeah, and it's very similar to what we saw with uh, Lewis Hamilton in the first couple of races of the year. It was Lewis and was struggling to get off the uh, at the starting line, and Rosberg was nailing the starts, and now their fortunes seem to have completely switched around. And it kind of went from bad to worse for Rosberg because he didn't really have that much pace. He couldn't really keep up with the Red Bulls. He eventually did get close to Max Verstappen and then made a very... Austrian Grand Prix like <laughs> move. <laughs> He's very Rosberg type of move because it's going to be named the Rosberg now when you go inside and you force your opponent outside by just not breaking. Yeah, well, exactly. If you list, go back and listen to the race radio, you can hear Max upset that uh, Rosberg uh, forced him off of the track. And then when you hear Rosberg's version of it, he says that, well, I just uh, turned in a little bit too late or I turned or I had too much speed, whatever it was. But yeah, if you look at the replay, it. he locks his brakes and he yeah. gets in there. And only at the very last second when he's almost at the curb on the far side of the track, do you see his left hand go up over the top of the cockpit and then does he turn right? So I think Max was well within his rights to be a little bit uh, ticked off about about that move. And that's why the stewards gave him a five second that turned out to be a little bit more than five seconds because nobody can count in Mercedes apparently. But it's been a five second penalty that cost him a podium for Nico Rosberg but gave both Red Bull a spot on the podium. Well, yeah, and isn't that funny with all the hundreds of millions of dollars that Mercedes invest into their racing program, it was probably a $5 stopwatch that malfunctioned (laughs) and they weren't able to actually time the five seconds. So 
Toto Wolff admitted after the race that they just manually counted and decided to hold him a couple of extra seconds just to be sure. But I don't think it really would have made a difference at that point. It was obvious that he was lacking the pace and was not going to catch either Verstappen or Ricardo in front of him. And again, it was a very impressive performance by Red Bull once again. They've been on the podium many times in the last several races. It was two in a row for Daniel Ricciardo, who was celebrating a P2 in his 100th Grand Prix. And how about that celebration by Daniel a on shoey. the podium? A shoey. I've never heard of a shoey before. I've seen somebody do it a few weeks ago. I can't remember where. He mentioned a Sumimoto GP driver that did it, an Australian Australian uh, driver. I didn't see that one, but I saw it before. And I, it's, yes, it's a uh, Australian tradition. A shoey. When you celebrate <laughs> something, you, you put a shoey. So you put your, your drink in your shoe and you drink it. That, that sounds extremely Australian, to be quite honest. Uh, especially <laughs> after a two-hour race where you use your feet during two hey, hours. If you're, and, hey, if you're going to celebrate, you might as well celebrate at in At least style. it's good champagne. It was a very top of the top of the uh, top notch champagne, too. So Chardon, those, those like bottles are like a few thousand dollars. So, you know, it's all good that it's a new shoe. At least, at least it's good quality. <laughs> Definitely. But another good thing for Ricardo and his fans is that, again, like in Hungary, he was looked quicker and was quicker than Max Verstappen, who in the last several races actually looked the speedier and the, the, the better driver of the two. But Ricardo seems to have found his confidence. He seems to have found his pace again. And that uh, is all good uh, for him. So Both drivers was... are pushing the car. That's what it looks like, Mark. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but that's what Ricardo said after the race. He's like, now that Verstappen is actually pushing Ricardo to do better, it feels like both of them are maybe getting more, most out of the car, which wasn't the case maybe before. So now that they're both motivated, the gap is closing. Well, and even uh, Christian Horner reckons they're only three-tenths of a second behind um, uh, Mercedes now, and they're going to work to try and close that gap even more. And it just really astonishes me because I think we talked about it maybe last show or maybe the one before, how Red Bull has really overhauled Ferrari, and Ferrari themselves have admitted that they have not made any progress since the beginning or middle of May. And I think in, in Formula One that, uh, that the sort of logic that if you're not really progressing or improving, you're s slowly falling behind everyone else. And they definitely have fallen behind Red Bull. And it, it makes you wonder, they really have turned things around this year. And they're, they're definitely the second best team behind Mercedes. And considering how well they're doing at the moment really makes me wonder how much they'll be able to close that gap to the Silver Arrows before the end of the season. Yeah, it's really interesting because if you mentioned just three-tenths of, of a second is not that much right now. And yeah, it depends. Sometimes the circumstances, sometimes uh, uh, the Red Bull was on ultra soft while, uh, while the Mercedes was on soft. So the difference was biased uh, during the race a little bit. But there is a short, shorter gap between the two team so it's interesting uh, Ferrari though clearly are losing ground with Red Bull and I'm not convinced with Mauricio Arrivabene every time he talks about his team it, it seems like he's the most non-Ferrari of the whole Ferrari Scuderia you know he's the less the least passionate the least interesting the least glamorous he's the least Ferrari of them all and he's the one in charge so I don't there's something missing there well, it's also interesting, too, because Ariva Benny said uh, earlier this week that uh, they're considering a McLaren-type shakeup at Marinello. And uh, James Allison, who was uh, the, the, the chief technical guy there, has uh, moved on. He left uh, just uh, within the last uh, couple of weeks. So they've been looking into maybe restructuring to a, a different style. And it, it's quite interesting that they should do that because... He's been, or Allison has been replaced by Mattia Benotto, who kind of lacks a little bit of experience in the, the chassis development uh, part of the, uh, the, the car and was really seen by a lot of people in the Formula One world as a short-term re replacement. Riva Bene, on the other hand, sees Benotto as the perfect man to lead the team with their new staffing policies. So they, uh, with this new uh, or reorganization or how they're restructuring things, has also put to the rest of the rumor that they were actually going to try and bring Ross Braun back into Formula One. But I don't know how, 
I don't know how realistic that was because uh, Braun himself said many times that uh, he has no interest or desire to return to Formula One in a full-time capacity. Well, that's the thing. If Ross Braun could be a type of advisor or bring his knowledge to a team without having to travel from race to race and be involved in the day-to-day operations, this is something that we don't mind to do. Uh, in the latest Goodwood, uh, Goodwood Festival of Speed in England, Ross Braun was there with his 2009 Formula One, and he talked about, yeah, it's not. I do miss the the sport, the aspect of it, but I don't miss the travel, don't miss being away from home, don't miss the pressure. So it, one of the only ways that Ross Braun would be probably involved with a Ferrari or even a Mercedes or any other team for that matter if an advisal capacity somewhere where somebody you can call and ask advice to and maybe go on with this but it's the only type of role that he would probably gladly take right now well some sort of fancy high tech consulting job would be a pretty with cool Skype, like yeah and like uh, a, ideal I, I mean if somebody wanted to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars to just offer my two cents uh, yeah, you said <laughs> at your desk operations. you sit at your desk and there's a camera in like in the the, the garage or motor home and you can control it and you can zoom and you have a speaker and you can talk he, he would have to travel and he can give his knowledge well, exactly. In this day and age, you can FaceTime or Skype and with those high resolution and high def cameras on any smartphone. You don't really need to be there in person. You can see it all from the, the comfort of your own home and uh, right from the, your laptop, or your desktop or even your tablet. So who knows? We can dream on, Kevin, maybe one day, but uh, I don't expect my phone to ring uh, anytime soon. But nope. again, it was uh, just going back to the Grand Prix itself. It was uh, Lewis Hamilton that ended up uh, winning Ricardo in second and then Verstappen in third. And Nico Rosberg eventually finished in fourth position and now Hamilton is starting to pull out a bit of a lead in the championship the 43 point lead that Rosberg had a couple of months ago over Hamilton is gone and now it is Hamilton who has a 19 point lead over his teammate of course that really isn't a huge huge lead of course if uh, Hamilton was to not finish the next race in Belgium, for example, and Rosberg was to win that one, then there would be a six-point gap at the top in favor of Nico Rosberg. But for Lewis, it is something, and it is really amazing how his season turned around because it doesn't doesn't really feel like very long ago when we were sitting here talking about how far Nico was ahead and how, how much he was dominating things and how it really has gone in, in Lewis's favor, even in the little bit of adversity that he's faced in this comeback that he's had, it, it really is really going all his way at the moment. Consistency is Lewis and Milton's best asset right now. The fact that he's not just first, but he's consistently first. He's able to stay there. The amount of life he kept this engine running for, like we should actually, uh, for the next show, Mark, after the break of the, 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 the F1 summer break, we should take a look at the amount of laps that this engine did. Because this engine is probably the reason why uh, Lewis Hamilton is still first in well, is first and is still in conversation for a championship. What if that engine didn't last the fact all the races that it actually did last, you know? He's been saving it for races and races now, but it already surpassed his life expectancy by what, three times? So the fact Something that this, like that. Yeah. yeah. So the fact that that engine was able to stay performant and to stay like as a whole and not blow up is quite an engineering feat. And the fact that they were able to get the most out of it, this might be the reason why Lewis Hamilton wins eventually the driver's championship. But this engine needs to be put like in a frame and on a wall or something, if it's even possible. Well, maybe he'll uh, find a way to take it home and put yeah. it in a in up on a pedestal and admire it uh, and res- <laughs> and give it the respect and love that it deserves. Because apparently Lewis said that uh, he turned the engine down only on the second lap in the German Grand Prix. By the time it was all said and done, he finished seven seconds ahead of Daniel Ricciardo in second. But he, it didn't really look like he was in, a, in an engine preservation mode out there. He was firmly in control of it, but... 
that just goes to show how smart of a driver Lewis Hamilton is. He's fully aware of not just the, the little details as in, okay, this is what to, where I am on the track. This is my lap time. This is what I have to do to stay ahead. And this is how much I have to lap or, or do my laps at to make sure I come out in front of Ricardo after I make my pit stop. But he's also uh, considering these other things that, as, as you mentioned, this engine that has far exceeded its lifespan and being smart like that and just using the power that he needed to, I think is a very impressive and, and, and very smart and just goes to show you how aware Lewis is and, and, and how determined he is to turn some of this adversity around and maybe even use it a little bit to his advantage. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. One team that's been disappointing as well, especially lately, Williams, compared to yeah. Force India. Force India has overtaken Williams in the hierarchy of F1 teams. And they've talked about uh, Williams. They have difficulty analyzing and getting the right data concerning the tires. So it gives them difficulty to adjust strategy in real time to know when to do the actual change. And they have a drop-off, which in Lehman terms, the tires are performant, they're performant, they're performant. So they're good laps, good laps, and boom, they're not good anymore. They don't have that fade out period where okay they're degrading laps are deteriorating and eventually they're not good no they just have that sudden drop off and they cannot explain it so williams really has to work hard to examine what component of their car what setting what camper angle whatever the case may be that does affect the tires in ways that it's not predictable and when that happens you're not able to recreate either a good aspect or bad aspect of your cars when i say recreate bad aspect is just recreate the same not this, not to recreate the same environment. So when you know why it happened, you can adjust something else so that the factor t- brings the tire to a bad, uh, bad state doesn't happen again. So they have to figure out why, and that's what they're not able to do right now. Yeah, and it, it is also kind of disappointing too if you go back and look at the qualifying this past weekend. Valtteri Bottas managed a P seven on the grid. And he was uh, split by the two Force Indias and his uh, teammate Felipe Massa was 10th to start the race and he didn't even finish. There was only two cars that didn't finish the uh, German Grand Prix. One was a Sauber and that is not really a surprise considering the problems that they're having financially. They just don't have the resources to invest in the car and they fall into the back of the grid. But you would expect that that Williams and Massa would do better, but Massa struggled with the car. He had no pace and he didn't last very long, but maybe just getting a little bit away from the the Grand Prix itself now. uh, It's interesting that now we're halfway through the year that even though some of the driver and and teams have been confirmed for next year, we know what's happening at Red Bull. We know what's happening at Ferrari. We don't really know what's going on with Williams. We know that Jensen Button probably doesn't have a contract at McLaren for next year. Nico Rosberg is still negotiating with Mercedes. But it's interesting, I think, that the McLaren and the Williams situation is is one to look at because Williams have been saying that they're interested in Jensen Button and they think that the combination of his talent behind the wheel and his popularity and what he does outside of the car and even away from the racetrack makes him a very attractive option for them for 2017 because Felipe Massa probably won't be back in a, in a Williams for next year, but... They're, they even said, uh, Claire Williams said the uh, the other day again, that they're not going to wait on Button and McLaren because there must be something going on there. Button had a P8 in in, in Germany and he's had some good results uh, recently, had another had a good race in Austria as well. So he obviously still can drive the car. Obviously the Will, or sorry, not the Williams, but well, the Williams has been, has been struggling, but well, I was uh, specifically thinking that McLaren, McLaren of course, isn't, that spot on all the time so for button to get a p8 at the german grand prix is fairly impressive but you can understand that williams aren't going to sit around and wait if, if button 
prefers to stay with McLaren and they're willing to give him another deal for next year. But they also have a very talented driver in Stoffel van Dorn, the, the young Belgian driver who's waiting to get into the car. And he scored a point in the one race that he filled in. Well, it was back in Bahrain, was it not? When he uh, took over for Alonso, who was still not medically cleared after he had that huge crash in Australia. But yeah, Williams is going to be an interesting one, and I, I do think it would be a good fit for, for Jensen Button. It's where he started his F1 career, and it would almost be like coming full circle. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing we quickly mentioned, but I just want to make sure we don't overlook it, Max Verstappen finished third. A, a great performance for Max Verstappen. He was able yep. to have a great start, got the second position on the start, wasn't able to hold it uh, because of tire wear and able to save as uh, save fuel and all that reasons. Uh, but it was able to give a great battle with Nico Rosberg, was put off track by Nico Rosberg. Nico Rosberg served his penalty, but Verstappen on the podium once again, his fourth podium since they made the switch from Kvyat to Verstappen. It, nobody could have expected this and nobody predicted this. No, definitely not. And I, I think it was... Obviously, a big surprise for everyone when they promoted him to the team at the expense of uh, Danny Kvyat, who said the other day that uh, he was. It, it was quite a tough thing for him to get demoted back to Toro Rosso, and he was pretty angry about it, and maybe tried a little bit harder than he should have to try and prove what he was worth in the in in those first couple of races, and was maybe trying to do more than what he and the car were capable of, but. Max Verstappen has completely justified the reasons that they had, and I, you know, I, I think that the the problems that Kvyat was having, obviously with uh, those run-ins with uh, Sebastian Vettel, just maybe sped up what was going to happen at the end of this year, at the very latest, anyways. And and Max Verstappen has definitely rewarded his his team and and his fans by by what he does and he's just a very exciting driver to watch and, and what do you think about some of the comments that are out there about Verstappen and just the way that he handles his car when he's under pressure and maybe being threatened to be overtaken by someone there's a some talk around there that perhaps he drives too much too much of a wide car or makes too many maneuvers but oh, I don't know he I didn't think crash into anybody so you can say that he's making maybe too many maneuvers but it's either to uh, get away from a contact or to make sure he doesn't create one. So it's never to take advantage of a situation that he overtakes off track. When he overtook Ricardo, there was a same um, uh, a steering move by by Rosberg. So he had to do it in the, the, the first lap of this race here. So, you know, yes, he does move around on the track, but not in a way that for me is unjustifiable and that is dangerous. The racing. Of course, you're trying to impede the other one in his race line a little bit, right? Well, of course, and when you think about uh, the, the, the Canadian Grand Prix a couple of months ago, just how smart he was in positioning his car going into that chicane at the end of the lap uh, where you come down that very long straightaway after the hairpin and just how he managed to keep Nico Rosberg from, from overtaking him and then eventually making uh, Rosberg just get a little bit outside of his comfort zone, get frustrated, whatever it is, and then made a mistake and actually spun out going into that chicane. And he, he, he didn't actually tag the wall of champions, but uh, Verstappen, definitely very cool under pressure. Exactly, and he's been quite surprising. And, you know, we mentioned the podiums. The win that he got, Kvyat would have got probably the same win in the same circumstances. This podium and the couple of other podiums that he had, I don't think Kvyat would. And that's to Christian Horner and the doctor, I uh, forgot his name right now, but the people that took the decision to put Verstappen in that car, they're the ones who came up with those four podiums. Yeah, definitely. And I think you're completely spot on when you say that some of those podiums that Verstappen had is completely up to his talent and skill as a driver. And yeah, I don't think that uh, Kvyat would have been able to uh, to match that either. All right, well, there's uh, just a couple more things to talk about before we uh, wrap this one up. Um, we talked about Jensen Button, but now let's talk a little bit about his teammate, Fernando Alonso. He said that he believes that there are only two teams in Formula One that could help him win a third world title. Now, one of them, not surprisingly, is Mercedes, but the other team that he believes that could actually help him win the driver's title is McLaren. What do you think about that, Kevin? 
think you want to make sure it doesn't get fired. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, to be quite honest, Honda's engine is quite, quite far from even being close to having consistent top five qualification. Never mind winning. Never mind talking about a championship. Yeah, that's very much what I thought uh, as well when I, when I read that, that he was just trying to be as political and as careful as he could. Of course, he's going to say that his team is one of the ones that uh, he could win a title with. But he did say that the, the Honda power unit and its development is still the main limitation that they face at uh, McLaren. But he also did say that he has no regrets about leaving Ferrari a couple of years ago. And he said that the decision that he made to re join McLaren is is more of a relief nowadays when you look at the, the the problems and the struggle that Ferrari are having and that they're not winning races just makes him uh, feel more secure knowing that he made the right move so anyway yeah, but you know what that. that's the mindset that if you're looking at the situation here uh, Alonso button with McLaren or even Vettel with Ferrari for that reason the driver needs to push the car the drivers pushed the car enough. The way Alonso talk about the lack of pressure, well, not it's not. He doesn't tell. He doesn't say those words, but he's more at ease. He's more comfortable when there's less pressure. Is that really the guy you want in your car, in the seat of the car, to develop the car to make it better, or do you want the guy that just obsessed with getting more speed out of the car? Like I know what Schumacher, right? I, I know which one I want, but which one would you take? Well, I think you want somebody like uh, Michael Schumacher that is uh, bound and determined to develop the car and get every every bit of speed out of it that you can, is willing to put the time in and work with not only the mechanics but with the engineers and, and anybody to get the, the, the maximum performance out of it. That I don't know how many guys there are in Formula 1 at the moment, but with seven world titles and 91 Grand Prix wins, it was obvious that Michael Schumacher knew what he was doing both in and outside of the car. And the Formula One obviously needs more guys like that. Exactly. And if I was McLaren, I would at least want one of those two drivers to have that in him. Alonso's got the experience. Button's got the the knowledge and experience of building cars. But do they have the drive that goes with it? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, and that is a very good question. All right, well, we're just about to wrap things up here for this show, but before we do, I just wanted to pass on a little bit of news that former F1 driver Chris Amon, who was dubbed the best F1 driver to never win a Grand Prix, passed away recently in New Zealand after a long battle with cancer at the age of 73. So condolences to his friends and family, of course, and he competed in Formula One between 1963 and 1976. So a bit of sad news. Anyways, I think that's a a good place to wrap it up. There's uh, obviously a lot going on with uh, (laughs) the the Olympics and obviously a lot going on on SPN, Kevin. Uh, Just let everybody know what's coming up on the network over the next uh, couple of days and um, also where they can uh, listen to the shows. Uh, Sportspodcastingnetwork.com, Monday to Friday during the Olympics. Five Rings Daily, every day, 11 a.m., you get your Olympics talk, Olympic discussion, results, uh, gold, silver, wood, and bronze medal. Wood, you're saying, yeah, we give a negative medal every day to something we didn't like. And we do this all week long during the Olympics. Five Rings Daily, every day, followed by Soccer Today. So uh, the schedule changes a little bit, but we're adding content we will continue to do soccer today as well and you can follow all of that on sports podcasting network.com very cool hey just before uh, we wrap it up here is that story true this afternoon that uh, one of the kayakers capsized after hitting a submerged sofa yes or is that just, I, I, is, I, I, that's I, actually a thing yes i've seen it a couple times and i think it is pretty legit uh, but just when just one thing here the quality of water people talk about oh the water is dirty the water have you ever been to a river lately? Have you been <laughs> to the river close to your place lately? I have. And I have maybe not seen a sofa. I've seen a fridge. I've seen tires. I've seen capsized cars. I've seen a lot of dirty things in the river close to my place. So what's in the river close to your place? And maybe Rio's even better than yours. 
Well, I live uh, not uh, too far away from the the mighty Fraser River, which at the best of times is a dark brown color due to all the silt and sediment that goes through it. So what is actually beneath the surface of the Fraser, nobody really knows. It could be a submerged sofa, piano, cars. There could be an entire city city under there. Nobody really knows. (laughs) Atlantis could be right there. It could very well be. Anyways, Kevin, thank you so very much. And of course, uh, where can everybody follow you online and catch up to what you're doing each and every day? On Twitter, at Kev Laramie, and follow the network on Twitter as well, at SportsPodNet. Very cool. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark J.R. Daily, and that is daily with an E-Y at the end. And of course, you can follow the show at Scuderia F1 Pod. Anyways, that is a wrap for us. We will catch you again in a couple of weeks when the Formula One season resumes and we get into the second half of the season, starting at the world-famous Spa Francochamps in two weeks' time. That's it for us. We'll catch you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Scuderia F1 podcast. If you want to get the show notes for this episode, then head over to ScuderiaF1Pod.com. Want to get in touch with us? Then email us at ScuderiaF1Pod at gmail.com. You were listening to SPN, the Sports Podcasting Network. Visit us, sportspodcastingnetwork.com.